Starliner Media. Starliner Media presents Music Night at the Majestic with your host, Michael Boswell. All right, it's time once again for Music Night at the Majestic. And with us tonight, Eric Abel. Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I'll tell you what, the, uh, uh, it's good to talk to another uh, former Illinoisan. That's right. Uh, I, uh, I grew up in Batavia, Illinois. But, uh, shortly after I was born, I spent my first five years in Kankakee. I don't remember much about it, uh, but, uh, you know, Kankakee is part of uh, our family's lexicon. Yeah, well, that, that that's where the Majestic Theater is. Nice. So, well, let's just start now with the whole full circle thing. Yep. But uh, I'm going to guess you and I probably uh, uh, frequented some of the same clubs around Chicago. Um, yes, um, for Chicago, uh, I got to more clubs when I started playing with bands because my family, uh, still has a house on Lake Geneva, Wisconsin and, uh, in Fontana, which is on the West end of Lake Geneva. And we pretty much, uh, would move up there every summer and, uh, then, you know, by the time, you know, uh, I, and I went to school in Wyoming and it, from Batavia to go to Chicago. Uh, now this is a very tasteless thing to say, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, from Batavia to Chicago it was about 10 miles too far to drive drunk. <laughs> so, I didn't go to a lot of club shows. I, you know, I went to, you know, the, your big rock concerts, you know, like, uh, Led Zeppelin or Elton John or Eric Clapton, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but I didn't start going to clubs in Chicago until I had started playing, uh, with Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. Uh, All right. you know, I went to some like mothers. Remember mothers? Mm -hmm. I, I saw the cramps there. I saw, uh, uh, Johnny Thunder's heartbreakers there, you know, and that would have been before I was playing with Joan, you know, it was, I'd be home for something. Uh, at the time I was living in Los Angeles, but I would go in there, you know, uh, and then when I started playing, you know, places like the Cubby Bear and, uh, you know, played a lot of different clubs over the years in Chicago. Yeah. Now, guitar wasn't actually uh, the first instrument that uh, that you learned, was it? No. When, when I was a kid, my mom went to a farm auction uh, and bid against herself three times and still came home with a uh what was called an apartment grand piano for just over two hundred dollars and uh in third grade, I started taking piano lessons and then in my town in Batavia, the public school had a really good music program with all great instructors and I started playing the trumpet in fifth grade, and I kind of uh talked a kid, a neighbor kid, into uh, loaning me a guitar around that time. So I started learning guitar in fifth grade. But, uh, and I played the trumpet all the way through college. And uh, I kind of credit the Batavia uh, music department, uh, especially, you know, as I came up, I started playing professionally around 1978 and uh dur during the punk rock era there was a kind of a there was not an emphasis on craft and fundamentals and i really had a background uh for that 
you know, from playing piano and singing in the church choir and playing trumpet, uh, you know, I learned a lot of things about being in time and being in tune and, you know, how to make harmonies work and, you know, stuff that I use every single day to this day, you know, and it was, uh, it was a really good, uh, the fundamentals were super helpful and, uh, different than a lot of my peers. A lot of my peers, you know, didn't want to play cover tunes and, you know, would only play their own songs, which is cool, but there's a lot to be learned from sort of decoding, uh, songs that are already written by playing them. Yeah. Tell me this, Eric, while you were, yeah, uh, learned to play various instruments and stuff, were you a big record guy? Well, I was, but it's funny, you know, nowadays people have access to the entire, entirety of recorded music. And, uh, when I was a kid, when you were a kid, you know, like, okay, a record when you're a kid and you're you have like a twenty dollar allowance or something you know if you're lucky it's hard to uh buy records i think when i graduated high school i probably had 35 albums you know and uh so and a lot of it would be like you know maybe you didn't buy the third grand funk record because your friend across the street had it, you know? Uh, so it's, it's very different than today. You know, like you had to, you'd listen to stuff on the radio, listen for things on the radio, or you'd borrow somebody's, uh, record to listen to it, you know? So, I mean, and I, you know, living that far out, Batavia only had a record store for a couple of years. So I had to go to Aurora to get a, to buy a record, you know. Yeah. Now, do so, you remember what the first, first LP, uh, album that you bought was? Well, I don't remember the first one I bought, but the first one that I got as a gift was, uh, Beatles 65, which is an American, uh, Beatles record that has tremendous songs on it. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when people, you know, get into this d discussion about, uh, the Beatles American releases versus the UK releases, you know, I know that the American releases were kind of perverted, that there was a guy at Capitol, they were trying to pitch stereo, so he, he took these tapes that were meant to be sung to mono and they had, you know, vocals and the guitar over here and bass and drums over here. And they released them as stereo and the guy put reverb on it, too. And uh, I mean, I wouldn't want anyone doing that to some record that I worked on. But at the same time, it was those records that blew my mind and a lot of other people. So I still. Uh, I have a fondness for those. Yeah. Are, are you still buying vinyl? Yeah. I especially like to uh, buy, you know, records by every one of my friends uh, that releases a record. Uh, you know, the, the economics of music today with the, the streaming, uh, I know it's wonderful for the user, but it basically it came along right at a time when artists like myself with the internet, all of a sudden fans could reach out and buy the records right from you. And uh, so we were starting to get the biggest slice of the pie that we'd ever gotten. And then streaming came along and basically uh, devalued all of our assets. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I like the vinyl. I love the package. I love to see the artwork and to hold the thing in my hand. And, you know, it forces you to listen to the record the way it was intended to go with the sequence. And then you get that moment to stand up and walk over and flip it over to side two. 
you know, and that's to, all of those things are magical to me. Well, there's something about going into a record store and you see all the artwork, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, cover art on the albums. They're just everywhere. Plus, yeah, like you're going into. Uh, I used to love going through through the used section because, like you were saying, you know, if you don't have a whole lot of cash, you know, that seven ninety eight, eight ninety eight for an album, you know, uh, forty whatever years ago, that was a lot of money, you know, for for a kid. Oh yeah. You know, so I would you know go through through the used bin and uh, and in the cutout section too. That was another big thing that I would always gravitate to as a kid. I, I never saw used records or cutouts until I got to New York City. And then there was a place called Sounds on St. Mark's Place that was, uh, you know, they had all the, that's where like all the rock writers would go. You know, I found out later that all this stuff came from, you know, when the rock writers, they would get sent stuff from the labels and most of it they would immediately sell. You know, because they weren't getting paid much to do these reviews. Uh, and we had a, at Sounds, there was a manager guy, and then this was when I was playing in the Dell Lords, and the manager was a friend of Scott Kempner's, and he became friends of all of ours. And so go, we'd go through and find the records, and when we found one or two, then we would have to like patiently stand around until our buddy was at the cash register. Then we went to our buddy and we got an even better deal, you know. So, and sounds, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they had the big sticker that was on the, on the used records and cutouts that said sounds. I mean, it was like, Two or three inches, and uh, I developed an excellent uh, technique for getting those stickers off. <laughs> uh, which was, if you know, if you take a lighter and just waft it, uh, you know, under the sticker, it heats up the glue, and then if, if you're careful, you can pull the whole thing off with no residue left afterwards at all. So that works on a lot of things. Yeah, the uh, the, li the lighter trick. Yep, yeah. yeah. the lighter or uh, hair dryer. That'll work too. Yep. <laughs> so, but yeah, you know the, the 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 for me, one of the good things was the stuff that I was looking for was stuff most other people didn't care about, which which meant that I was you know had access to to a lot of stuff that would you know wind up in the bargain bin or whatever. And to me, it was like finding gold. Yeah, but for for most people coming in who are looking for yeah you know, the latest yeah you know, thing, yeah uh, yeah it was it wasn't uh, their cup of tea. But to say, but for me, it was just you know, a regular weekly treasure trove. Yeah, no, the browsing was incredible too. Like, and also, if you're waiting for a new record from somebody, you're still browsing, and then. You know, if you've been reading album credits and then, you know, I remember I'm waiting for some record and then I see this guy, Bob Marley. Now, that's the guy that Eric Clapton did his song, you know, and I'm, and there was nothing else for me to buy that week. So I bought the Bob Marley, you know, and that's like, uh, the difference between going to the store and ordering online, you know, like for shopping for food using Instacart versus, you know, walking down the aisle and seeing what looks good to you. Exactly. Well, yeah, uh, like like you say, yeah, reading the the liner notes, yeah, you know, where you'll see either songwriters, producers, other musicians. Yeah, there's you know, a lot of folks where yeah, you know, I would see a name to this day for that matter. Yeah, if it's somebody that I know has played on a bunch of stuff I already have or like, what have you, and I see, you know, see their name come up on something else, you know, I'll give it a shot because odds are it's probably you know going to be within my you know audio wheelhouse. For sure, yeah, that's always always been the thing, and you know, and it's the browsing, 
browsing the racks is a lot better than that, you know, than searching online for the stuff like that. Yeah. Now tell me this, what's one of the uh, the biggest finds that you did where, where you just kind of stumbled upon uh, a really cool record? Well, I don't know. I, I, for a while, I, you know, there's, it's hard to find a musician who didn't work at a record store for at least a little while. And when I was in, at the University of Wyoming and kind of after I quit and I was still there in Laramie with my band, I was working at the, uh, this record store that was right across from the dorms. And I, I, I think, uh, I don't know if I put it like a find, but you know, when when punk rock happened, that it there was a lot of residual good things that went through it. You know, it was like about uh you know uh you know more elemental rock and roll and people started going back to uh Things like the Elvis Sun Sessions or Eddie Cochran or, you know, uh, so I, I think finding things like that, uh, like Elvis had become, you know, in 1977, it had been become pretty irrelevant, uh, and, uh, you know, but coming across a, Sun sessions were and listening to that was incredible, just incredible. Yeah, exactly. Now tell me this: what would, what what album in your collection would uh, folks be most surprised to to find? Oh, I don't know, but uh, I I was just talking with Steve Wynn just the other day about uh, you know, everybody can rattle off their own personal top 10 uh of favorite records and uh we both somehow i just got this new book about miles davis and uh to me the miles davis jack johnson album is a really uh it's an amazing record uh at an amazing time with an amazing group of people you know the the idea of fusion of jazz rock hadn't even it had not been explored yet you know and uh that one i think is uh, is to me it's it's always in my top 10 cuz it's just so crazy mhm yeah absolutely well say before we get to, too far down the road you mentioned going to a school in wyoming how did you go from illinois to a school so far away well, Laramie, Wyoming was exactly 1,000 miles from Batavia, Illinois. And uh, so I thought mistakenly that if I went there, you know, my parents wouldn't show up unexpectedly. Uh, but my mom did one time. And uh, I, I just, I uh, I had learned how to ski in Wisconsin, at a lot of the, the, in Lake Geneva, we had a small a neighborhood ski area called Majestic Hills, uh, and, uh, live at the Majestic. And Majestic Hills was a, a little ski hill that had, a maybe, I forget, three chairlifts, and it was, uh, on the grounds of what used to be a chicken barn. And they turned it into like a, you know, alpine looking thing. Um, and, uh, the, in the, in the late sixties and all into the early seventies, a lot of famous bands played there. When I was a little kid, I'm too young to go, but like the Rolling Stones and the Kinks played there. And, uh, uh, it, it, it was a, pretty incredible uh place but so i got into skiing and i wanted to go somewhere where i could ski and uh and wyoming was also for out of state it wasn't that expensive so i picked wyoming well that, you know, that that's a few pluses right there yeah 
So, and of course, you know, while you're there, you found the, the dirty dogs. Right. Hold on just yeah. a second. Um, yeah, so uh, I had gone home. Uh, at one point from college, I was back in Illinois and, you know, one of the greatest radio stations ever in the Chicago area is still there, WXRT. A lot of people were turned in, turned on to a lot of great music from XRT. And I, uh, I won tickets to see these two bands I'd never heard of heard of you know the, like the fifth caller gets two tickets to see what turned out to be the ramones and the dictators at the ivanhoe theater and that was uh i went to that show with a buddy of mine and it was i was i knew nothing about punk rock and uh it was just a it was unbelievable Un i just i just couldn't believe it and it was a great bill too because the dictators played first and they were kind of these those bands are from the same scene but the dictators uh they were almost like a gateway because they had conventional rock and roll elements in you know like guitar solos and stuff and then when the ramones went on i had never ever seen or heard of anything like this how they they played so fast, and uh, their stage pre presentation was amazing, and it, it was like a life changer for me. Uh, so when I went back to school, I uh, got to Laramie, and I was hanging around in a uh, music store, and I ran into a guy who, you know, who was talking about putting a band together, you know. And I said, you know, I'll play anything, even country. And and I find out that the guy has got the idea to start a punk rock band, and that's how the the Dirty Dogs started. Uh -huh. That had had to be a uh, a big learning experience for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and uh, uh sorry, uh. The it was uh, it was phenomenal, and we were lucky that we had. Uh, there were a couple other people that were in to the music, and uh, we found out about uh, this amazing record store that was uh, in Denver called uh, Wax Tracks, and we went down there, and from them we. Uh, you know, they got, they found out that we had a PA, <laughs> you know, that our PA was more important than our music <laughs> to them. But we started opening shows and, you know, for touring bands. And that was a real great thing. Wax Tracks became a label and, you know, they're, they've been in Chicago for a long time, but they started in Denver. Yeah. So, Dirty Dogs, how did you go from that to in the Black Bean and uh, in the Black Hearts? Well, the Dirty Dogs, we kind of had done everything that we could do out there in Laramie. And we, we, including we made a little 45 where we got this guy, we found him in the phone book, Rocky's Recording Service. <laughs> and the guy, this guy, he, he, he went and mostly he recorded school bands like the orchestra or and he would make these albums for them that they would put out he had a lathe and everything and a portable recording setup so he came and recorded us and uh we put that record out and it's funny i was just talking to steve Wynn. you know we got reviewed in trouser press and it was pretty in, intense, but we knew that we had to leave Wyoming, and we decided that New York would be too cold, so we decided to move to L.A. And also, by that time, the the Dirty Dogs had, we were a rather controversial, 
controversial in Laramie and we had gotten banned from the university for something or other. And so what we did is we decided to change our name to the accelerators uh, and get one more really good paying university gig to get us out of town. And that worked. And uh, we named ourselves the accelerators after the uh, what became the Fermi Lab in, in Batavia. At the time, it was called the NAL, the National Accelerator Lab, which is uh, still on the forefront of, you know, physics and, you know, subatomic particle research. Uh, uh, so, you know, I got to, the band got to LA and we did make a record as the accelerators out there, but the guys, it, it, the band fizzled, but I liked being out there and I started playing with other people. And I had put together this uh, little band, bass and drums, and me playing guitar. And we we played with several people. We played with a guy named Rick L. Rick, who was in a band called F Word. And uh, we recorded on the Rodney on the Rocks uh, compilation, kind of a, a thing from L.A. at that time. And I was also playing with Top Jimmy in his band before it became Top Jimmy and the Rhythm Pigs. And that was a real honor for me because I uh, I replaced Billy Zoom from X in that band. And, uh, and then Joan Jett put an ad in the paper in the L.A. Reader that said, Joan Jett is looking for three good men. And... Uh, I signed up for the audition. We all did. And uh, we all won the audition. And which was kind of incredible, you know, because we already were a band. And it, there were like 180 guys tried out for each spot. And John Doe from X, who's still a friend of mine, uh, I never found out this story, the the how and the why until maybe five years ago when I ran into John at one of their gigs at the city winery. And he's like, did I ever tell you about that audition? And I was like, no, oh, you know, and cause he was helping, you know, if you're auditioning for band members, you, you can't, you don't just go in there and play guitar by yourself. So there had to be, there was somebody playing drums and John Doe was playing bass. He was like helping Joan with the audition, right? And if they were trying out bass players, he played guitar and, and so on. And uh, I guess uh, at a certain point there was a break and John Doe says to Joan, you know, you know, you're going to have to ride around in a van with these guys. And there's a lot of uh, assholes, you know. Uh, the, You know, it, back then, that was at the beginning of uh, GIT, BIT, Guitar Institute of Technology, Basin. You know, there's all these, like, musos that were playing fast and blah, blah, blah. And and John was like, you you know, you know, Eric and Gary and they've already got a band and they're cool. You should just get them. And Joan was like, OK, I'll do that. <laughs> and that's how we ended up in the band. It's like and I didn't know until years, you know, 35 years later or something. So that was kind of funny. Yeah, absolutely. So now the uh, uh, what was it like when you guys you know headed out with Joan and things started to happen? What was that? Well, uh, like we you? started the band from scratch. So she did, had these auditions. We decided we're the band, and then uh, you know she was like on the L.A. punk rock scene. She was like the rock star, the the accessible rock star. So she would be at the gigs. I had met her at some gigs and, uh, she produced the Germs album GI 
which is a seminal record, you know. So what we did was, this is like a page out of uh, The Who, what they did at the Marquee Club. We went to the Whiskey A Go-Go, and I forget if it was Monday or Tuesday, but we picked the slowest night and said, we're going to play here once a week on for a month. And we literally went from zero to 60 in that month. Uh, and that was a thing that also years later, when we started the Dell Lords, we did the same thing at CBGB's. Although we knew it was New York City and a lot of people would be at our very first gig. So we played out of town, uh, like out in Long Island for several months before we ever played in New York City. But we did that same residency thing. Yeah. So, uh, I Love Rock and Roll comes out. What was that like hearing yourself on the radio? Well, I Love Rock and Roll. So, I was out of the band by the time the album came out. But I Love Rock and Roll was first recorded by Joan as a 45 with Steve Jones and Paul Cook from the Sex Pistols. And the song was, uh, you know, in the days of broadcast TV, when you only had like four or five channels, they would have these shows that were called summer replacement shows. And, and over in England, they had one that would have bands on in the summer you know, until they started up the dramas again in the fall. And that was the theme song for the show. And, you know, we learned later that it, it was done by a band called the Arrows and the guy, the writers were from New York. And, uh, you know, we played that song the whole time we had the band, you know, we played it for two years before the album came out. And we literally, at every gig, it didn't matter if we were opening. I mean, the last gig that I played with the band, we were opening for Alice Cooper, and they were throwing stuff at us and, you know, booing. It was it was horrifying, you know, throwing quarters, you know. And we're in a coliseum, and it was, you know, the whole audience, you know, was the Lions. Until we get to I Love Rock and Roll and we, then we won. You know, that song, we won every night. And in the music business, it had gotten around that, you know, Joan had this song and like every big producer in the business came and tried to get the, uh, the job producing the record. Even Roy Thomas Baker on that, my very last gig Roy Thomas Baker was there trying to get the job and the guy Kenny Laguna who's still her manager today he just turned them all down and he did it himself and uh it you know became a monster hit now when it came out I had already been kicked out of the band and I was back in Chicago area in the coldest winter I can ever remember uh, doing concrete construction outdoors in February. Uh, so it was uh, in, you know, hearing yourself go up the charts and, uh, and also our friend, the Go-Go's, they, at the same time, they were booming. It was not a lot of fun, really. I wouldn't think. But I was back there saving up money to go back to New York City because I really liked New York City and I felt that I could do, in New York, I felt I could do in a day what it took a week in Los Angeles. Uh, so I saved up and went back there. Yeah. Then, obviously, the Dell Lords. How did you guys come together? Well, I was, uh, you know, trying to put a band together and I found some guys to play with. And I, my idea actually was to try to get a band together and bring Rick L. Rick back to 
uh, bring him to New York and uh, start a thing with him. And, uh, you know, back then, <laughs> it's really funny talking about these old habits, but back then, nobody had a beeper, nobody had an answering machine. You know, you're I'm talking about 1982, 83. And uh, sometimes you'd be at home waiting for somebody's call. And I spoke with the guy who I played with a couple times, a drummer, and he was like, yeah, you know, I played with uh, Scott Kempner, uh, top 10 from the Dictators, and, and uh, they had this thing, and it was kind of like uh, The Clash and Johnny Cash and it was and the guy was saying i i just hated it you know and i was like oh yeah that sounds awful and then, as soon as i got off the phone i started calling around to try to track down top 10 and i found somebody somehow i found his number and called him up and the next day both me and frank finero who became the drummer for the del lords we showed up on the same same day at this uh funky rehearsal room in on eighth avenue that it actually used to be madonna's room and uh you know and then that became the band and the you know for the whole time uh from 83 to 90 whenever we sort of pulled the plug yeah so that the the uh, how did you end up working with Lou Whitney? Well, the uh that was another kind of dictator's uh connection. So this guy, Rich Neeson, who was the dictator's tour manager, and and forgive me, I I don't exactly remember how this happened, but he Neeson was doing some kind of like tour managing for Steve Forbert and uh, Forbert had a record, you know, and he was in there as one of those, the next Bob Dylan kind of uh, scares and he needed to put together a band. And I don't know how Rich Neeson knew about these guys, but he's like, you know, there's these guys in Springfield, Missouri, and they're really good and they can play any kind of music. So, Rich knew about uh, Lou, and that first band was the Skeletons. But then, in the, by the time we were playing in the 80s, in 83, I can't remember, I think it was probably in 83, the Morels came to town, and they were uh, going to be playing at the Peppermint Lounge, and... Uh, so, and Ross, the boss, who is the guitar player in the Dictators, he's like, you're going to see these guys, you know. And uh, we went and we were blown away. And uh, that very first night, you know, so, and this, I remember it because it was, uh, there was a huge snowstorm and it was Valentine's Day. Uh, so we went to the gig and then we brought a, funky demo tape that we had and gave it to Lou and and Lou was like well I got a studio in Springfield Missouri if you guys make it make it down there I'll record you and uh we didn't even have a van yet so after that we we bought a van like a uh it, I think it was a used van that somebody had it had formerly been a service master van but I mean this is like you know, the Bottle Rockets have that song, Thousand Dollar Car. This was like a $400 van. And we drove that down to uh, Missouri to work with Lou. And then for me, it, my connection with him, you know, stayed on for the rest of his life. It was a real life-changing event for me uh, to to know all of those guys and get to play with them and everything. Yeah. Well, tell you, you mentioned the Morels. I love their cover of uh, I'm a Hog for You, Baby. It, yeah, and that's one that I learned uh, when I was playing with Top Jimmy, and that was like 
you know, when you, so something like that, you know, Jimmy didn't have a copy of the record of the coasters record. He just kind of sang it to me and, you know, like that, that guitar player or the guitar lick, which is by Mickey Baker. It's a really bizarre, simple thing. I was like, really? Does it really go? He's like, yeah, it goes like this. And that wasn't even the solo. The whole solo is one note, you know, and, uh, you know, with the, uh, with Joan, probably my favorite gig that we ever played with Joan, we played the pier in New York City and the coasters opened and, uh, they, we didn't do I'm a hog for you baby with them, but we had them do, uh, Rebel Rebel. We used to do Bowie's Rebel Rebel. We had them do it with us and, so Joan would go do 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 do, and then the coasters would go do 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 do. It was just fantastic. It was so great, and they they had their uh, guitar player who, at the time, he seemed like the oldest guy I'd ever seen with the guitar, and it was probably not as old as I am now, but <laughs> you know he he was going to sit in with us, and I at the time I had a two amp rig and one was a music man and the other one was a cane front vintage hundred watt marshall you know no master bond and i had so much fun plugging that guy into the marshall uh so it, it was a terrific gig and i i just loved the morels uh you know they played on my first solo album the roscoe's gang uh they're the band. I, I kept going down there and, you know, I re, I produced a lot of records out of Lou's studio. Uh, I referred to him as my guru. There's just so many things. A lot like the, my school in Batavia, Illinois, there's not a day that I don't use something that I learned from Lou, you know, doing what I do, producing records. Yeah. Now the, the the second album, uh, how did Neil Geraldo end up producing that track with you guys, or that album, I should say? Well, um, you know, we had record company, and uh, you know, Scott. There were a couple people in the mix, you know, like Dave Edmonds, and uh, Scott really wanted him. Neil Giraldo and Neil Giraldo had actually at the same time like had gone to the record company and said I want to produce these guys so it was sort of it was sort of one of those things that got easy because there were elements on both sides that wanted to work together so and that was a real experience for us you know cuz we went out to Los Angeles we had a real budget. We're, we're like living in there at one of those Oakwood, uh, residence places. And we recorded at fantastic, like literally historic studios. We recorded at Cherokee, uh, for that album. And, uh, we used a, you know, I, I wasn't really in hindsight. I wish that I had paid more attention to the, recording gear and what they were doing you know the Cherokee had uh one of the rarest uh recording consoles of all time there's the called the Trident A range and there were only 13 of those made and they had one and uh but I remember for me <laughs> uh they had uh me in some booth with my amp and there was the synthesizer of the day the yamaha dx7 and and just like sitting in there and i was like i no i won't even touch my guitar until you get this out of the room you know it's like this is a uh you know that at the time you know back then when somebody asked you about what kind of music your band played rock and to say rock and roll it really 
it's not that it didn't mean anything, but it did, wouldn't place people in a, in the space that you were hoping for. So you had to say what you weren't. You know, we're not new wave. We're not synth pop. We're not, you know, hard rock. Uh, we're not rockabilly, but our guitars are clean. You know, so it was a, it was a difficult time. Uh, and, uh, also with the recording, uh, that cleaner guitar, it wasn't on a lot of records. Literally, you know, what I know now about engineering and stuff, uh, there, there weren't a lot of guys that knew how to do that, to get that, uh, cleaner guitar on tape with a natural sound. Uh, but Neil, he was, he was good with the band. He w helped us with the arrangements. And then also, I think what I, probably the biggest thing I took from Neil is after that, we went on tour with them and we played a lot of the, the big places, the basketball, hockey arenas, you know, and he's a great guitar player. Uh, both Scott and I at the time played really heavy, like, custom gauge strings uh 12 to 56 which is is very heavy you can't even buy a set like that that doesn't have a wound g you know so we would have to go to manny's and buy him each individual gauge in packs of six and neil played the heavy heavy gauge also you know there's something about the resistance that makes for a i don't know it's a better experience you the bends you have to do them just right it it's a positive thing to, to have the resistance but the way he played in those big places he didn't he played uh melodic solos that you could kind of sing there might be a little fast flourish every once in a while but guys that play too fast in a big place like that, the, the notes all get lost. And I was like watching him do that. And I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. You know, you know, uh, and that turned into another thing of Lou's <laughs> years later, uh, which he was like, slow down, turn up. <laughs> <laughs> the eighties, we played pretty fast when, you know, uh, you know, my guitar brother, Scott Kempner, he uh, lost his battle with uh, Alzheimer's dementia last year. And uh, we recently did a tribute concert for him with a whole bunch of guests at the Bowery Electric. And, uh, you know, we were going back to uh, learn the songs to do them with a whole bunch of guests. and. Damn, we were playing fast in the eighties. Right? I had to import some of that stuff into Pro Tools and slow it down a little bit. Like, well, this is how we would play it, you know? Because <laughs> it was, we played pretty fast back then. Yeah. I tell you, you mentioned about having this, the the synth of the studio. Uh, it, it's hard for me to, to picture true love being recorded with a synth. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, and we played that one at the, the, uh, thanks for mentioning it. We played that one at the, that was the last song we played at the, the Scott Kempner birthday gig. And our drummer, Frank Panero, he came out front and, uh, sang lead on that one. And we had, uh, Dennis Dyken from the Smithereens playing, uh, drums. Uh, yeah, there, I mean, Neil, he's I, on the next record. He snuck a couple of uh, synthesizer licks in there, but uh, you know, my it, I I like to think of uh, you know we were on the same label as Jason and the Scorchers, and my buddy Warner Hodges. We we eventually had a little band together, and uh, but back in the day, uh, Jason would introduce warner as the the one man war against the synthesizer 
<laughs> that that is an accurate. Uh, <laughs> <title>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jay, you, you mentioned the next uh, next record. Uh, on that, the track Cheyenne. I love the tone of the guitar on that one. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's one of my uh, favorite uh, recorded guitar solos. Uh, and in fact, on YouTube, I've got a playlist of my favorite recorded guitar solos that I did. And, uh, and I, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't remember the exact rig that I used. I'm pretty sure it was a, uh, Telecaster into a Fender amp, uh, with a little slapback, but I really try to come up with a solo that, you know, is hummable, you know, to go along. And I also did the, uh, the little counter melody too, you know, thank you. We like that one. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that, that, that's a, a great track. And, uh, Home of the River is another one. It's just, that sounds just phenomenal. Yeah, we did that at the, the tribute show also. Uh, yeah. it's hard when you have all those albums, uh, to whittle it down the song list, you know? I mean, when, back in the day when we were playing, we'd have songs that we did and then we'd be doing, like any band, songs from the new album and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, now that one, that album too, you also had the, uh, the uh, uh, Did Judas Kiss, which was a Dictator's song. No, Judas Kiss was uh, not a Dictator's song. Uh, oh, okay. Stay With Me, one. Stay With Me was a Dictator's song. That, that, there you go. And that's on a later album. But uh, Judas Kiss, that was one, like the arrangement, uh, that was Neil's arrangement on the Based on a True Story album and uh it always uh and it was me singing it and uh it always felt to me odd that it was so poppy when the story is about a guy and his girlfriend he's losing her because she's getting into blow and and uh crack and you know she's on a descent so I played it a few different ways until my record Knucklehead has what I feel like is the definitive version, and that's with the the Yahoos are the band and Steve Earle is singing the harmony. Uh, but it's more of a a blues, like a swampy blues, to mm -hmm. go with the the story of the song. Right. But on Judas Kiss, on the Based on a true story version, there's uh, Pat Benatar is singing with us and Sid Straw is singing with us. Sid Straw is the more prominent voice in in that one. And was it uh, uh, was that the the first time you'd worked with Mojo? Was on that album? Well, the first time that we recorded with him, we had when our first album was out. Uh, was in 84 and we were on tour and we had this tour manager who was kind of a knucklehead himself who we had gotten you know stuck with because by the record company and he decided that he needed to take some of our money and buy a little portable tv that he could plug into the cigarette lighter so we could watch this phenomena show of 1984, which was Miami Vice. <laughs> so we used to watch that on Friday nights with the rest of America. And this one Friday night, we're in San Diego and in the van, in the parking lot, watching this show. And I'm like, I just had had it. This is ridiculous. I'm going in to see what's going on in this club. So I go in there, and I was confronted by something. I just, it was the most wild and unexpected thing I'd ever seen at to, in my life at that point. 
So there's a guy in a bunny suit with a TV on his head, you know, sounding like Holland Wolf and, you know, and uh, Elmer Gantry at the same time. Uh, and I just came running back out there and was like, come on, you, you guys got to get in here and see this. And, th and that was Mojo and Skid. They were opening. And so we be became fast friends. You know, when Mojo and Skid, their first time they came to New York, they stayed at my apartment. Uh, you know, we did a, a bunch of touring with Mojo and Skid where it was the, uh, Mojo and Skid. The Dell Lords and the band Treater Wright. Uh, that was a triple bill that we did a lot of shows with. And, uh, you know, I stayed friends with Mojo my whole life. Uh, you know, he got me to be part of his band on his first solo record, Otis. Uh, so in that record is, uh, myself and Bill Davis from Dash Rip, Rip Rock on guitars. John Doe on bass, Country Dick Montana on drums, and uh, Jim Dickinson as the producer and keyboard player. That that was a tremendous experience. Uh, recorded in Memphis. I got some songs out of it myself. Uh, the song that's on the Yahoo's record, Monkey with a Gun, is a pretty much verbatim story of me and Country Dick going to see Hank Williams Jr. play uh, at the, I forget what the, the name of the sportatorium is, but we were invited by these uh, record collector guys who put a band together, and uh, they had a fluke hit. They were opening for Hank Jr. They didn't even have road cases. They, and it was the Kentucky Headhunters. They, uh, they invited us, me and Dick, to come to the show, and it was kind of a crazy, it was crazy. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, the, the, uh, uh, I interviewed, uh, Country Dick and the Beat Farmers a couple of times, and every time it was an experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I saw Dick on, uh, his last time in New York City, you know, and they were still kicking it as hard as ever, uh, uh, and they're going to be on the, you know, that uh, w they just announced the lineup for the 2025 Outlaw Country Cruise. And I I'll be back on the cruise doing my own songs and playing with Sarah Borges. And the Beat Farmers are on that one, too. And Dave Alvin's on. It's, it's a great lineup. Those That uh, Outlaw Cruise is, is really a phenomenon. I'm yeah, glad to be days, part of it. You know how to get to uh, to make it. Yeah, you gotta uh, you gotta get yourself on the list right away because it sells out every single year, and it, it's mm -hmm. a it's a it's an experience like no other. In the for the audience and for the musicians too, the, the a lot of the audience doesn't realize that us as performers. You know, we don't get to see a lot of bands. You know, even if you're on a festival, you're really probably only seeing the band that goes on before you and a little of the next band before you have to get and drive somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And on those boats, you're on there for five days with all these musicians that you know from all over. And there's uh, collaborations that happen because of that proximity. They're, they're really nice. They have great equipment. Uh, nobody's on those boats that isn't into the music. Um, and also, so I kind of knew all of that, but the thing that I was unprepared for is that uh, those people that see you on the boat, they really become super fans. And for Sarah and I, you know, since I've been playing on that cruise, I don't think we've ever played a gig anywhere where, and I'm talking overseas too, where somebody didn't show up and say, Hey, I saw you on the boat. You know, it's like, and it, it's really, it's harder all the time to get people to come out to gigs, but those people really become super fans in the best way. Yeah, that's great. So, 
I'll tell you the uh, for the for the sake of time, we'll yeah, keep moving here. How did you end up uh, producing the records with Diesel Only Records? Well, that was the the earliest, some of my earliest producing stuff. And Lou Whitney had kind of told me about producers. He was like, you know, Roscoe, sometimes a producer can just be a guy who's actually been in a studio before. And, you know, by the time that those bands like the world famous Blue Jays and the Clintons and you know, I'd already made a bunch. I've been making records for quite some time, and I knew how to do it, and I, I knew I could help those guys, and so that's how I started. And then, along the way, I also realized that the producer thing, the music business is so youth oriented, you know, and the producer is the one position where experience really counts like people people don't they don't have to get a producer who's 25 you know they they can they want a guy with experience who knows his way around songs and studio and working with bands so i really started that was a big help for me to get started uh the diesel only records you know, it went on from there. Yeah. Well, yeah. The 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 number of people that you've worked with over the years to me is just amazing. Yeah, you know, who you've crossed paths with, and yeah, you know, who you've worked with. So. Well, I love doing it, and uh, I love songs, and I also love bands, and you know, for me, the producer thing. So mostly, I work with either bands. Or I do a lot of producing for sort of singer-songwriters that want their record to have more of a band feel than a regular singer-songwriter record. And, uh, you know, I like to say I've, if you, if you look at the studio and there's a producer and an engineer and a songwriter guy and then the, hot guitar player and then the rhythm section you know like i have sat in every one of those chairs you know so i can uh empathize with each person recording studio is a really complicated place and it's like you uh extraneous things don't help and uh it's really good to have a guide you know when uh, I, I remember there was an artist I was helping him and, you know, like we had a, uh, like a two day session or three days and we had things to get done. And when we finished the guy and he'd never had a producer before, he was like, man, I, without you, I wouldn't have gotten the first song finished. You know, it's like, it's. It's really, uh, I was just talking on the phone before this interview with Jimbo Mathis, who is a guy that I've produced and he's produced me and, and, uh, he also worked with Jim Dickinson and, and, uh, you know, Dickinson was a very quotable guy and one of his was, you know, in music, democracy is very overrated. <laughs> you know, like, Somebody's got to be in charge, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, it's freeing for everybody. You know, if, if the songwriter doesn't have to also be thinking about the fill that the drummer's doing and to get into the third verse, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's freeing. So I like doing it, and I've been lucky uh, to continue to get jobs working with all kinds of different artists, and a, a lot of them... Uh, if you look at my list, uh, come back, you know, it's not just one record, you know, we're working on several records together or somebody like the bottle rockets. I think there's seven albums that I did with them. Uh, so. Now to, to me, that's the biggest compliment when, when folks want to work with you after that first experience, then yeah. Yeah. That says a lot. Well, they got to you know 
a band has to want to be produced. You know, you can't like you can't do it to somebody that doesn't want it because it's uh it's just not like that. It's such an intimate thing, you know. I mean, you have to be able to say things about what's going on without people getting too uh, wound up about it. It's it's a daunting thing, but it's also at the same time it's exhilarating to go from that acoustic demo to the finished mastered record and sequence and and know that other people are enjoying it. Yeah, I've always likened producing to putting together a puzzle. Yeah, you've got to have a vision for what it's going to look like in the end, and uh, but you've got to also have to be adept at putting all the pieces together and making them fit properly. Yeah, yeah, it's or or it's like a good uh, like a manager of a business uh, of a of a restaurant per se, you know, like. It, the best manager is the guy who has actually done every job in the place, mm -hmm. you know? So. Exactly. So, I'll tell you, you mentioned the Yahoos. I'd be, re be re remiss if uh, I didn't uh, touch on that, because uh, uh, I just love those records. So, tell me about how yeah, the Yahoos came about. Well, w when I was working on uh, what became... My second solo al album, Loud and Lonesome, my manager at the time, uh, was, he was also publishing my songs and he put me together with some people on some, you know, like writing trips. And I knew, I knew Dan Baird because the Del Lords played a bunch of gigs with the, uh, satellites and I'd even sat in with them a few times and, uh, so we put together this trip. So I was going to go to Dan Baird's house when he was living in Kentucky. And I talked to Dan a few times on the phone and he was like, well, let me get Terry Anderson down there too. You know, because he was like, you know, sometimes when you have, he's really great. And if we get stuck, he'll come up with something, you know? So I went down there and we wrote a bunch of songs and at this, at the time, and, uh, he had this little, little, uh, little cabin in his backyard with no running water. It was just like a, not a, not big enough to call it a barn, but that's where we were playing and stuff. And we were making demos on his four track, which was really a three track because track four didn't work. And, <laughs> And after that, he was like, you know, if we got Keith Christopher, we'd have a band. And uh, then a bunch of funny things happened. After that recording session, then Dan had made a solo record for uh, Rick Rubin's label. And Terry had a record coming out. And uh, at the last minute, Dan got stuck through no fault of his own, in a feud between Rick Rubin and, uh, oh, what's his name? Brendan O'Brien. And Brendan O'Brien is a super engineer producer and a great guitar player. Like, he played, uh, every note of lead guitar on the first Black Crows record. You know, he's, he's not credited as producer. But he was the guy that actually got everything done. And anyway, uh, so just before Dan's record comes out, uh, the bearded one pulls the plug on the tour support. So we decided to let's have this, let's put this little band together and we'll go out and promote everybody's record at the same time. So at first we were calling it Dan Baird and the Yahoos, then it became the Yahoos, and uh, as something that we would do every once in a while. And uh, we had played a little bit, and this was also around the time that I had opened the bar, the Lakeside Lounge in the East Village with my buddy uh, James Marshall, also known as the Hound, and there was a guy 
record company guy who actually had signed the satellites. His name was Howard Thompson. And in the record company vernacular, there's a thing called a development deal where they give you X amount of dollars and to cut some songs so the guy could take it to the company, right? And so that Howard nicely gave us some dough to uh, record some songs. And then we talked about it, and I was like, you know, he's not going to sign us. So this is five grand. You know, we could go to a pro studio and record three songs, and and then that's all we'd have. Or we could take this money, and I could rent some equipment. We could go to Terry's dad's house in North Carolina for a week. And just write and record some songs. So that's what we did. And that eventually, you know, we did that. And then <laughs> that <laughs> eventually Bloodshot Records put the record out, which was great because literally we had gotten tired of making copies for our friends. And it didn't come out until five years later. Um uh, and that was the record, uh, I actually have it here. Fear Not the Obvious. And, uh, so, you know, that's how that happened. And, uh, it, it was just, a. we loved doing the Yahoos. It, it was kind of like a relay race, you know, as opposed to when you have one singer, when you have all four guys singing, you know, you can push harder because, you're only going one lap and then you hand it to the next guy. And, uh, so it was really, we loved doing that band. And then we made a, the second record, uh, what's that one called? Put the hammer down. Yes. Put the hammer down. <laughs> uh, you know, we made that on our own. Uh, we asked for more money from bloodshot after the first record. And we got the, the email came back. We received your hostage demands. <laughs> We've decided to pass. And at the time, I was like, well, I think I could put this out myself. So, But the good part is that uh, Bloodshot has new owners. You might know about that. And uh, we're working on uh, hopefully reissuing the two records on vinyl with a couple extra tracks. And that'll come out eventually. Yeah. Now, that'd be great. Well, I'll tell you, I'd fear not the obvious. I love the swagger of the opening track. What are we waiting for? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that was like, you know, uh, everybody contributed lines. You know, it's like, uh, it's happy hour all the time. You know, it's like, or like the great one says, you know, talking about Jackie Gleason. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the first time we got to Spain, uh, Spain has been good to me for like all the bands that I've played with. We got to Spain. I remember we had like driven like a day and a half to get there from somewhere else, you know, and this place is packed to the gills and uh we start that bah, nah, 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 nah. and then the audience was louder than us the whole audience goes what are we waiting for <laughs> we're like wow <laughs> you know it, it's it's great to have songs like that you know and you can't mm -hmm. do it without a really unique group of guys like that too you know yeah well, I'll tell you, the, the, the second one, Put the Hammer Down, the, I love the guitar on Where's Your Boyfriend At? <laughs> Thank you. I think I did that one, too. Uh, oh, well, Dan is playing that rhythm. He's playing that... He almost sounds like a synthesizer. His right hand is like a rock, you know? So, uh, yeah, we that was done at my first... Uh, cowboy technical location 
in uh, on Hope Street in uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. So, and yeah. that's the studio that I own that that I've had been in business for 25 years with my uh, partner Tim Hatfield. Yeah, uh, which I I want to get into, but the the Yahoos, you guys had some interesting cover choices. <laughs> How did you decide to do Dancing Queen, Your Love Train, in Rome? <laughs> well, they all came about different ways. Like uh, Dancing Queen, we worked it up on the road. We we're playing in Scandinavia, and and I don't know who suggested it, but I was like, you know, that's a Scandinavian Louie Louie, and I could play. Instead of that synthesizer line, I, line, I could play it like a cowboy lick, you know, and it, we just worked it up like that and it became a thing. You know, it was like, I mean, it, one of those things like just get out of the way and let it do its thing. Uh, Rome, that was Dan's idea, you know, and, and I, I always loved when we were on stage and he would, introduce it as his favorite southern rock tune you know <laughs> and uh love train i mean it, that would just felt like it was made for us with uh trade and verses and, and uh you know it, it's fun taking those songs and putting a ronka ronka on it you know like just making them rock like hell you know mm -hmm. so. yeah well, I'll tell you, to, to digress, you know, here for a minute. Yeah, you mentioned Roscoe's Gang. One of the tracks on that, uh, Lose 30 Days in the Workhouse. That song, to me, you know, sounds like it could have been an old Webb Pierce song. Yeah, I, I mean, the first time I heard them do it, I just couldn't believe it. You know, I, I literally couldn't believe it. And, you know, so I love the Morels and, uh, I, you know, when, uh, when we're making that Ross gang record, this is coming out on a, a nationally distributed label. And I was like, we got to do this song. And I, I still do the song and it's, you know, to me, it's sad that it's still relevant. You know, I hope someday that it won't be relevant, you know, but it, it's very relevant. And, uh, you know, I was like, wow, Lou, you wrote that one? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> it is a timeless thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Say, but, yeah, but the, uh, the, the sound that you captured in, in, with that track, I mean, it just nails to me the perfect production value with the song. Well, you know, on that one, we had gone, you know, there were guests in the studio. We had gone to pick up. Peter Holsapple from uh, the DBs were opening for REM and they played in St. Louis. So we went to to St. Louis to pick up Peter, and then uh, Mojo and Skid were supposed to be there. And Mojo, I think at the time, had to uh, hop off the road because he had like kind of overdosed on Jolt, Jolt Cola. And, uh, so on that one, it's Skid Roper playing the, it's not a drum kit. It's Skid playing his like rhythm stick, you know, so it, it, it's, uh, it sounds different than the rest of the record and it, it fits with the, uh, but it's still like, you know, Donnie Thompson playing the solos and, you know, mm -hmm. it, it was, uh, and then having all the guests trade off on the verses, Lou, Sid Straw. Peter Hall's apple. Yeah. So. Well, see, I, I mentioned before about how, yeah, I'm, I'm amazed by the people that you cross paths with, work with, what have you. You and Robert Randolph, how did that, how did you guys end up? Well, um, this guy, Gary Waldman, who was managing me, uh, he's a great guy, tour manager. He, he did, he had a whole bunch of really cool guitar videos that he put out during the pandemic. I'll try to send them to you, but Gary's a great guy and he, he heard about 
uh, Robert. And, uh, Robert, at the time, he had, he, like, his whole recorded output was he'd done one song that was on one of those Sacred Steel, uh, compilations. So, uh, you know, they, he had Robert come to my studio, and Robert got there late, and, uh, for some reason, car trouble, he was coming with, from Jersey, and he had this young guy with him who was playing drums. At, I mean, he didn't even have his, his own drumsticks. He came in with these, like, frayed drumsticks. I gave the kid some drumsticks, and I, I think it's in, there's a Robert Randolph movie and that where they talk about uh, this session, but those guys came in and uh and like Robert, his whole thing was like super developed and I just hit go on the tape machine and after a couple songs I I started playing bass myself because it was so cool what they were doing. So then in addition to that, you know, I had the Lakeside Lounge and just like we were talking before about the residency, uh Robert did like a month of Tuesdays at the Lakeside Lounge, and by the time he was done, he moved it to Irving Plaza. You know, there were so many people, and then, uh, and then, uh, they, at one point, they asked me to produce him, and there, there was a, like a lot of money and stuff, and I just, I had to, after a day in the studio, I just had to, like, kind of say, no, uh, you know, I think it would be better if you got, like, a really good engineer like Jim Scott to do this, because I'm more used to working with people on songs, and these are all songs that have been recorded before, and I, I, I still feel like it was the right thing to do because Jim Scott was better. And uh, I haven't seen Robert for a while, but, you know, on that album Live from the Wetlands, I have I have a lot of equipment, but one of the things that I have is I have the ultimate pedal steel speaker cabinet. And Robert had just thought that I got the best sound for him, so they borrowed that cabinet. And it's a... Uh, I once was chastised for not having the right speaker by the great Tom Brumley, who who played with Buck Owens and mm. uh, Rick Nelson's Stone Canyon Band. But the, this uh, 60s JBL 15-inch speaker is still the O-N-E for pedal steel and I have that cabinet and so they had to borrow that cabinet and it's on the cover of the Live at the Wetlands. Very cool. So, and then how did you end up playing guitar with Run DMC? So I got a call from this guy about me being on a session and uh and the guy says, Can you do Warren Haynes? And I was like, well uh, not exactly, but Warren Haynes plays classic electric rock and roll guitar, and I can do that. Uh, and so they were like, well, be at the studio. And it was the, the recording was done at Chung King House of Metal. And, uh, this was kind of a hot studio in the nineties, and it was, uh, Everlast and Run DMC doing a version of Steve Miller's Take the Money and Run. So <laughs> I go there with my buddy, the kid, who's helping me with the equip equipment, and I get there and we introduce ourselves. I'm just like, I'm Roscoe and this is the kid. <laughs> like, and they're like, Roscoe and the kid. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I had thought about the song and I brought the B bender guitar. Do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. So, so a B bender guitar is a telecaster that has on the B string, it's routed out in the back and it has a 
basically a pedal steel pull on that string. And I, uh, and I was like, I think this will work good for this song. So I brought the B bender and, uh, you know, they had, this was a fancy studio. And back at the time with the whole sequencing, you know, they're doing a lot of stuff with MIDI and they had even rented a vintage computer, like a Apple Mac plus with the floppy disk to run their sequencer. And, uh, and so I brought my little amp and I brought a couple of guitars, brought the B bender. I'm playing these country licks and, uh, you know, it's Roscoe and the kid with Everlast and, uh, run DMC. And we called it, and this is before, long before this became a thing, but we called it Hick Hop. And, uh, because it was, it was Hick Hop. Now, you know, it's been maligned by that, uh, Bud Light hating guy. Uh, I'm not even going to say his name. Yeah, I'm, you can say it. Uh, but, but we invented hick, hick hop. I can say it. We invented it right there at the studio with, uh, Run DMC and Everlast. Wow. Now, to, uh, to change, switch gears here, how did you come to work with Marshall Crenshaw? Uh, just knowing him for a long time. Um, uh, you know, he's a, he, I mean, for a long time, People just thought about his songs and they didn't realize like what a great guitar player he is. And he's a great guitar player. And when we, uh, you know, when the Dell Lords were coming up, he was like, you know, above us on the New York scene. We've seen him play for years and, uh, uh, I've done a bunch of stuff with Marshall over the years, like maybe cut a few songs or help him with this or that. And recently he played with us on the Scott Kempner thing. He sang uh, Tallahassee Lassie. Uh, at one point, I uh, I went on an audition for his band. And, uh, and I uh, showed up and I get there. And do you know the song Fantastic Planet of Love? Oh, yeah. That's one of his songs. And I mean, it's got every chord in it, like every chord. It, it, the, the way the thing goes, it's like, it's got every chord. So I get to the audition and he's, he goes like, Oh, by the way, we're doing this a half step down. It's like my eyes. Like, <laughs> so I didn't get the, I didn't get the gig. Uh, but we've always been friends and, uh, I love Marshall. I love his sense of humor. I love working, you know, yeah, in the studio. The, I think the first thing we did, we did uh, a version of Prince's Take Me With You. Mm -hmm. And uh, on that one, we were in the studio and it was Marshall, myself and Andy York, who's a longtime compadre of mine who plays in Mellencamp's band. And, and uh, Marshall was like, I want all three of us to play bass at the same time. <laughs> that that was crazy. We did it, you know. Uh Marshall he's got a record called Jagged Land that came out maybe maybe 10 years ago, but I I have this thing where uh I think that's one of the best later late career albums by any artist. I mean, Jagged Land to me is right up there with his very best records. Uh, much like there's a uh, Cheap Trick record that was the last one that uh, Bunny played on called The Latest. That, that's as good as any Cheap Trick record that ever released, you know. Uh, and I love that somebody, you know, so far into the game can still be doing such a great job. Like Marshall and, and Cheap Trick, yeah. Well, the the uh, the latest that was one of the, the records that they did with Julian Raymond, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, and so, he's yeah. the guy who produced the Glenn Campbell Ghost on the Canvas, which is a great that, record. That great worked record. its way into my absolute top ten. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, I've always loved Glenn, 
and uh, I didn't, I wasn't really aware of Julian Raymond until looking at the liner notes on that one, you know. And uh, I mean, do you know much about that record? You well, know, like he's he spent a lot of time with Glenn. And he was literally recording and writing down things that Glenn had said, you know, and he, he wrote, wrote, they wrote songs together and Julian put these bits of, of Glenn's conversation into the song. It, it's so personal, it's so personal. Mm -hmm. And the, all those little interludes, uh, they also really set up the songs amazingly. And uh, the latest has some of those interludes also. Yeah. Yeah. The the, uh, uh, the he he did a couple of records with Glenn. Uh, he's also worked with Brian Setzer, who you know is on Ghost in the Canvas. Right. It, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, with the, on that trick it, track, it's Chris Isaac, Dick Dale, and, and Brian on there. Uh, yeah. In my arms, I believe it, it is. Uh, yeah. But yeah, he did stuff with, with Roseanne Cash, like we said, uh, uh, Cheap Trick. He did the, the the Fastball album, All the Pain Money Can Buy. Yeah, it was, was it had some nice stuff on there. So, oh, he's yeah, phenomenal. A lot of, a lot of he, good things. He gets a great vocal sound too. Uh, like uh, I, uh, I hope to meet him someday. I don't, I don't know if he's in Nashville, Los Angeles, uh, but I hope to meet him someday. Really, one one of my favorites of uh, newer guys. You know? Yeah, well, uh, like well, like what you said, you know, he's he's great at capturing the vocal, but what I I think you know his biggest strength, you know, is he can make the people that he's working with. They're all for the most part all long time established artists. He makes them sound like them, like the record that you would want to hear from Cheap Trick or from, you know, from Glenn, whereas a lot of times, those later records, you kind of get diluted, we'll say. Uh-huh. Well, yeah, he just does a great job. I mean, they're, those are hard-hitting. I was, for a while, I was using the latest as, uh, sometimes I help clubs you know, refurbish their sound system, and I was using that as a, uh, a uh, test record, you know, once we get everything set up. Well, let's hear this, you know. So, yeah. Well, say, you mentioned Cowboy Technical. How did you you come to uh, start your studio? Well, you know, I had been producing records, and uh, and a lot of times, you know, when I first started recording in New York, you'd go to a studio and they had almost no equipment in there. I mean, musical instruments and amps and stuff. And uh, for a long time, I was working out of this place, Coyote, and it was that was a place that uh, grew out of the Del Lord's rehearsal room. And if I was doing a project, I'd have to bring in all my stuff, I bring like five guitars, I bring some outboard gear, like some compressors and some mic trees and stuff, you know, and it just kind of, it just seemed like that I should have my own place. And I had started working with Tim Hatfield, and for a while, we had our stuff in this other guy's place, and, uh, we learned some stuff there. We learned that we had a lot of good equipment, and we also, that was our first experience recording in a, uh, what I call a no control room setup, you know, where everybody's in the same room, like the drums are in the same room with the console and everything. And I, uh, I really, you know, I'd heard about that. I'd heard about like Daniel Lanois doing stuff like that in a house and everything. Uh, but, but, uh, doing, recording that way in practice, I thought was kind of inspirational. You know, like, uh, there's no room for guests in the studio. In all my time recording, I've never seen guests have a positive impact you know you you have this group and you're working together and all of a sudden somebody else is there and then 
you know, this person is worried about that person. It's just not a positive. I mean, if a record company guy wants to come and buy lunch, that's great. Okay, thanks for lunch. We'll see you. We got it. You know, the, the, the story that I use is, you know, even if you're the biggest baseball fan, you you don't get to go to the game and pull your chair up behind second base, you know. So this one room thing, we had experience with it. And uh, we found ourselves where we had to move our equipment and we had no place to go. And we moved it into this band's rehearsal room. And and we realized, hey, you know, I think we could set everything up and you guys wouldn't even have to move. So we did that and we started recording. And that's, uh, you know, since that was our first location, now we're we had two in Williamsburg. And now we're at our third location, which is in Greenpoint. And we've been there for. uh eight years and it's a similar setup where there's one room but we do we've learned some tricks along the way like we have there is a booth so if the singer or somebody wants to be in the booth they can do that and then we have these other guitar iso cabinets but at the studio you know i've got a whole bunch of guitars and a whole bunch of amps and a real piano, and a real Wurlitzer, and a real Hammond A100, you know, and a beautiful set of drums and extra drums that don't go on the road, like all this stuff. With my experience working at other studios, you know, sometimes you'd see this equipment on their list, and then you get there, and the guy would go, oh, that's broken. You know, it's like my whole thing has been to have our stuff super functioning and we can work really fast uh you know like we're ready to go uh so it's been a real positive for me to have you know be involved in that place with with uh tim hatfield and uh mario vialey who's our engineer that i work with a whole lot uh the yeah, studio really is just, it. it's it's difficult but but you know it's kind of like the producer thing you know people can do this on their own but really once somebody does a whole record on their own or they're in the house you know then they see all the reasons why it, they it'd probably be better to have some help or you know like Cheap microphones don't sound good on cymbals, you know, stuff like that. You know, some place, it's good to go to a place with resources and people that you can, that can help you. And so we have a lot of clients that like our place. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm going to guess you uh, applied that same basic philosophy to Lakeside Lounge, having played a lot of, a lot of, uh, clubs where the sound wasn't that good and there's you know, issues here and there that you, uh, work to avoid all those pitfalls well the the uh when i was playing with joan jet we ha had a night off or we played in chicago and then we were invited to the blues bar and this was a bar that belushi and Aykroyd had set up it, it was a private bar and it was behind i think it was down an alley behind the earl of old town and we went there and you had to Okay, it was an unlicensed club, so you had to buy some drink tickets, and then you would pay for the drinks with the drink tickets. Jim Belushi was behind the bar when we were there, and they had a pool table, but they also had a stage with all the... It was all set up. Like, there was a drum set and amps and everything, and I was like, that's cool. And so when it came time to do the lakeside... You know, in New York City, there's a lot of problems with uh, volume. And there's also, you know, th this is going to be a pass the hat kind of gig. I didn't want musicians to have to, like, pay for a cab to get there with their amp. So we had our own equipment that was the perfect size for the place. And uh, 
that really helped it sound good. It sounded really good in there. And then my partner, the Hound, he programmed the jukebox. And there is still a lakesidelounge.com website, and it has the list of everything that was on the jukebox when we closed. And he referred to the jukebox as a self-cleaning oven. <laughs> you know, it's not a digital jukebox. So someone couldn't go in there and put on some something that wasn't on our uh jukebox you know so uh if somebody didn't like buddy holly and the stooges then they'd leave and we'd be like that's good <laughs> see you later we got room for somebody who likes the kinks they can come in now you know so yeah it was a terrific place yeah well uh, what one of my rules of life is if you don't like buddy holly i don't want you near me so well <laughs> I get it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, uh, one thing I probably should have asked at the beginning was, how did you get the nickname Roscoe? Well, I, uh, when I, when I was living in, first living in the East Village, the Del Lords are playing, I, I, uh, my friend, Jim Marshall, the hound that I, he took me to this after hours bar called No Say No, and, uh, you know, the place, it had a little bar, and there were, like, five seats at the bar, and then the other five seats, the bar was filled into the wall, and that was the stage, and, and I was like, people play here, and and the guy was like, yeah, you want to play here, and he, he pulled out the book, just like, let's put a date, you know, and, it, it's, and what should I call it, and I was like, now, when your name is Eric, there's not a lot of permutations of Eric, but I had lived in California on the corner of Roscoe and Rosita, and I somehow, it, in a moment of clarity, I said, uh, Roscoe's gang, and then I became Roscoe. That's that's the story. <laughs> For good or bad. <laughs> Tell, tell me, I mean, Eric, there's so much stuff uh, that we, we didn't get to, but you'd, you'd be here all day if we did. So, but uh, is there anything that we that we didn't touch on that you want to make sure that we do? Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm on Instagram as the Eric Amble, uh, and uh, I'm working on, some, there's an upcoming Sarah Borges record. I'm uh, working on tracks with uh, John O'Manson, and I recently started another collaboration with Steve Wynn from the Dream Syndicate. Uh, you know, I'm I'm just working all the time, uh, and I hope to have an, uh, another Eric Amble record out soon uh, by the new year, uh, and Sarah Borges also. And I, I appreciate, Michael, that you asking me to be on your show and uh, the Kankakee connection. I <laughs> How about that? I, well, I, I don't really have many stories about Kankakee, but I have one that my parents told me about. And uh, we lived in the neighborhood. You know, there was, a, you know, Alan Shepard, the astronaut mm -hmm. he lived in kankakee for a while um but we lived in this little house and it had a garage in the back and uh and uh one day i came back you know i had i mean i'm a little kid i'm like four years old and they smelled something on my breath and uh and they smelled gasoline, and they had to take me to the hospital to get my stomach pumped. And evidently, my dad was working on a gas mower, and he had poured some of the gasoline into a Coke bottle. Just there, there was excess. And as a little kid, I went back there and uh, and uh, and I drank that gasoline, and I had to go get my stomach pumped. But that's about 
that's my most Kankakee story that I have. <laughs> well, I'm glad it's a happy one. Yeah, in the end, <laughs> everything came out okay. So. You live to tell. Yes. All right. I'll tell you what, Eric, on that note, we'll bring this one to a close. I you know, really thank you for taking the time to join us here. My pleasure. Thank you, and thanks for sticking with me through uh, the trials and tribulations of scheduling in the modern world that we live in. Yeah, no problem. So, all right, everybody, thanks for watching. Have a good night. This has been Music Night at the Majestic with Michael Boswell. If you enjoyed this edition of Music Night at the Majestic, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and at musicnight.net. Music Night at the Majestic is a copyright production of Starliner Media. Any use of the accounts and descriptions of this program, its audio or visual content, without the express written consent of Starliner Media is prohibited. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time for Music Night at the Majestic. This is your announcer speaking.